You're listening to Queer Poem A Day, Lineage Edition, on the Deerfield Public Library podcast. Featuring contemporary queer poets reading, first, a work of influence by an LGBTQIA plus writer of the past, followed by an original poem of their own. This is Dolan Zavagno, host of the Deerfield Public Library podcast and co-director with poet Lisa Hyten on Queer Poem A Day. On this last episode of Queer Poem A Day Lineage Edition, we have something really special to share. When we asked poets to share their poetic lineage, we could not anticipate that the idea of discovering lineage would relate to our music as well. Here's a bit that we cut from our intro episode, released June 1st, featuring Lisa Hyten, our pianist Daniel Bear, and me. There are lots of poets whose work was cut short because of the AIDS crisis who we're going to hear. Also, I this is a great opportunity for Daniel to tell us a bit more about why the AIDS word scared so is the piece that we will hear this year, and I'd actually love if you could share with listeners how you even found the piece. So I came across this, and the title was just immediately sort of something that grabbed me, in part because scherzo comes from the Italian scherzare, which means to joke, and Robert Savage, the composer, was writing this while he was being treated for AIDS in 1992, about a year before he died. So that sort of cynical, sarcastic, ironic humor I recognized as something that I would do. And and so that kind of grabbed my imagination. And the more I listened to it, the more I, I fell in love with it. I think um, when people write something down, they're, they're uh, extending their hand to the future and asking them to join us. And when we look back, we're holding the past's hand. You know, using the score, it's not in a printed edition. It's, it's only in the handwritten score. And the, the notes themselves have this clean urgency to them. And the instructions are really not like anything I've, I've seen before in playing. You know, even it starts off with, with nas- the word nasty you're supposed to play in a nasty way. And that's like really. So Daniel, also when you found this piece, you sent some images of Robert Savage's work, the actual sheets. So you just described to our listeners some of the words and the handwriting of notes, but can you also mention there was one Um, photo you sent in particular. Yeah, so I got these scores from the New York Public Library uh, at Lincoln Center. So as I was going through his scores, they they had a whole box. There was a a piece called Chacon, I think it was, and it was dedicated to John Ashbery. So the idea that there's this conversation happening between queer people, especially artists, is so luminous to me and speaks to why a lineage year felt like something we needed to do, especially when things are being censored or hidden or buried in classrooms and in libraries right now. The idea that there is, you know, the, a hand of the past wrote to one of our great recent losses of John Ashbery and the fact that we, you know, it's the, the mystery of... To, how close they were or how intimate they were, we still haven't figured out, but I love that these things are just kind of arising from our even having the conversation. It felt like a very New York story. Danny was at the Lincoln Center texting me these pictures and it felt so exciting, you know, no one knew about this connection. It didn't seem like anyone knew or cared. I care so much about John Ashbery, about this poet and his work. And and so does this composer, apparently. What was wild to me when I saw the picture and saw this scrawl of handwriting, particularly because it was handwriting, I at first thought, is this one of those things, as a writer, I think about where it's, it's for John Ashbery because that's a person of influence and Robert Savage is younger and maybe, like you, 
maybe the works of John Ashbery were just important to this person. And then I'm thinking, well, maybe it is a New York story. Maybe they were pals. Maybe they had had a beverage together or seen each other read or play. And this mystery just came afoot. And it also seemed somehow to become our obsession with lineage because the music was going to frame every single thing that we chose to do this year. Well, and I think about a a reader's mind because in a reader's mind all of your favorite authors know each other and are influenced by each other or pushing against each other but sometimes when you learn enough about these people it's true you know knowing that Robert Savage was writing in the 70s and 80s in New York uh, it seemed possible that he would have encountered John Ashbery because this mystery was before us I reached out to Jory Graham and other poets who I knew knew John Ashbery just to see, have you ever heard the name Robert Savage? Does Who might know the name Robert Savage? I reached out to Andrew Epstein, who runs the Locus Solus blog on the New York School of Poets and has written several wonderful academic books about the, the New York School. And... He thought it was a very interesting story. He had some suggestions, actually. He found the small amount of information that is out there on Robert Savage and said, well, he was at Columbia. And Ned Roram taught at Columbia. Maybe I'll defer to Daniel here uh, to tell us a little bit about Ned Roram, because he is also somebody that just recently passed last year. Ned Roram is a wonderful 20th and 21st century composer. He said a lot of John Ashbery. And he was a prolific diarist as well. He mentions Robert Savage several times in his diaries. He mentions other composers, including um, David Del Tredici, who's on the CD that we have of Robert Savage's music. He's one of the most important composers of the 20th and 21st centuries, and certainly for art song. So that was Andrew's first suggestion of maybe the connection between mm-hmm. them, knowing Ned Roram set John Ashbery, perhaps they were connected. Andrew Epstein says, you know, I also went to Columbia and was taught by another member of the New York School, Kenneth Koch, to love John Ashbery. He taught many people to love John Ashbery. And he said, by the way, reach out to the Flowchart Foundation. So the Flowchart Foundation is a nonprofit organization that holds public programs and performances and exhibits. I'll quote from their website here that explores poetry and the interrelationships of various art forms as guided by the legacy of American poet John Ashbery. So Jeffrey Leppendorf is the executive director there and is also a musician. Jeffrey said, let me reach out to David Kermani, John Ashbery's husband. Now, I never would have imagined we would get a message from David Kermani. David writes, quote, wow, small world. Yes, Jay and I were friends of Robert Savage. I'm not sure exactly how that came about, but of course Robert was a protege of Ned Roram's, who by that point had done some Ashbury settings. And there was always the Columbia slash Kenneth Koch possibility. We were good enough friends that as we were approaching our first summer in the Hudson House, 1979, we wanted to hire someone to help at the house, mostly basic cleaning at that point, and Robert's living situations were usually unstable. So we offered him the chance to live and work there, but he insisted, understandably, on having a piano. Now, I have to tell our listeners, this house that John Ashbery and David Cremani bought in Hudson, New York, is very famous. David would later tell us, as they were setting up the house, things moved very slowly in those first few years, but gradually came together, and the NYC and international cultural worlds became right at home in Hudson. This house has actually been cataloged in a virtual tour through the Yale University Library Digital Humanities Lab. And Karen Rothman, who's Ashbury's biographer. Welcome to the private home of the legendary American poet John Ashbury. In this first ever interactive virtual tour, explore the spaces and collections that inspired his life and work. The Digital Humanities Lab at Yale University presents John Ashbery's Nest. 
you can go through these different rooms in this Victorian house and click on pieces of art that were gifted to Ashbury by well-known artists or click on objects like the piano in the music room. And we find a clip of John Ashbury himself speaking. When I first got the house, we weren't here very much. We had a friend of mine house sitting for us, but he had to have a piano because he was a composer. So I got this very cheap piano from an ad in the penny saver. But no one knew the name of the composer he was talking about, Robert Savage. And by the way, just hearing his voice, because so many of us have heard him read in person or all these recordings of him, it's so distinctive that that Rochester area accent, so does New York he's from. So here we have this composer living this itinerant kind of artistic life, having this support of friendship. And by the way, John Ashbery, very experimental poet, many people listening might know this already, but difficult poet, been reviewed as a difficult poet for years. It wasn't until around age 50, when Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror came out and won National Book Award, Pulitzer, all these book critic circle, the triple crown, people called it, because no one had ever done that. That's when David and John were able to purchase this house. So here you have this artist in the prime of his creative years supporting this younger composer and letting him not only stay in the house, but purchasing a piano for the house for the composer. Now, in these emails, David Kermani had a slightly different memory from how John just told it there. I'll read from David Kermani. John and I agreed that we didn't want some cheap spinet, but one that would be a nice piece of furniture for the music room. We looked in all the local newspapers and penny saber type tabloids for ads. I finally found a handwritten note tacked to a community bulletin board at our local shop writer Price Chopper grocery store. I called the number, discovered it was a baby grand instrument located in a house in the rural eastern part of the county, and went to see it. The owner's price was $500, which wasn't a small sum of money in those days, but we both liked it and figured we probably wouldn't do any better than that, so we bought it and arranged to have it delivered. Robert settled in, third floor bedroom, late spring, I suppose. John and I were there on some weekends when we weren't mooching off friends in the Hamptons. <laughs> now, in this series of emails, David Kermani and executive director of the Flowchart Foundation, Jeffrey Leppendorf, were both thrilled to realize that this piano is now in the Flowchart Foundation space where they host readings and music events and all sorts of fantastic art projects. In case we haven't made it clear, David Kermani said they might have been vaguely aware that Robert Savage dedicated a piece to John, but they did not have it in their archives. David Kermani even went to library school <laughs> to catalog his partner's uh, then husband's work because it's so extensive. And the Ashbury Resource Center now at the Flowchart Foundation will be able to link to Chacon by Robert Savage. Danny, what does Chacon mean? Chacon is a set of variations over a ground bass or a set of harmonies. So you take the same harmonies again and again and you vary the music around it. I wanted to share the opening of Chacon, Opus 8, with you, the work that Robert Savage dedicated to John Ashbery. John Ashbery was born in 1927 and died in 2017. Robert Savage was younger. He was born in 1951 and died in 1993 from complications due to AIDS. In 1979, Savage was asked to be the house sitter for the home in Hudson, New York, that John Ashbury and David Kermani had bought. While the Chacon is dated 1982, we do not know when Robert Savage first began working on it. It may have come from work that Savage did while living in Ashbury and Kermani's home, or it may have been a token of admiration from one artist to another.
know, the the little that is known about Robert Savage is, of course, the AIDS word scherzo that we're playing. The Chacon comes from an earlier part of his career, pre-HIV positive diagnosis. Chacon and Pasacalias are often used interchangeably. Chacon, to our modern ears and modern definition, is a little bit more somber in character. You might think of the Chacon from the D minor violin partita by Bach. To me, these little minor stories are like playing the minor chord. They seem insignificant and small. It's something that you might chatter about at a dinner party. I'm wondering if you might tell us what else was divulged about John Ashbery and Robert Savage and what us finding this work that maybe was minor, particularly because Savage, it's his life ended in a different way than anyone would have wanted to or planned for. That the AIDS word scherzo was sort of his, one of his last pieces of music for us. What might David or John have said, and I think we might have language from David in our, our final exchanges with him so far. David told us that Savage, quote, traveled a great deal and was hard to keep track of, and we pretty much lost contact with him during the last years of his life. David also told us that he's really pleased that this story, maybe minor as it is, about their friendship with Savage and this lost dedicated composition, the history of this piano, are now all publicly coming to light. David writes again, John Ashbery believed that Robert Savage was a serious and very talented musicologist and composer. I know that John would be delighted that this is happening, as am I. ask you because I don't have the words to talk about Robert Savage's music and stylistically we've heard the AIDS word scherzo this whole month on Queer Poem a Day and it has both these very violent sections and very smooth calming sections and I think we even talked about them being nostalgic right or labeled nostalgic in the music can you share any more about just stylistically what Robert Savage was up to. As the century progressed, you saw composers willing to mix different styles of writing. If I can mention Sam Barber, his style mixes tonality with sometimes serial writing, sometimes atonality. In fact, in his Nocturne, it's a very tonal piece, clearly in A-flat major, but it uses a serial row. It uses a 12-note row. Robert Savage in AIDS Ward Scherzo does something very similar. He's mixing a lot of different influences. Uh, Zydeco, minimalism, neo-romanticism in a way, tonality, atonality. In fact, in the really violent, brutal sections, we expect tonality to kind of ground us or to make us feel at home, but really the chords that he puts in are so frightening and so disorienting and so aggressive that they the tonality feels as alienating and as terrifying as the atonality. Now part of me wants to make some sort of connection to John Ashbery's own work, because similarly, his poetry is often described as shifting registers rapidly from uh, different high and low tones or different emotions or high and low references. This sort of creation of a shadow, there's a hidden corner of language that is of interest to Ashbury and to the mind. I'm thinking also of the images, like the Victorian houses and things like that. There's a way that there's ornament 
and different registers of ornament, some of its linguistic, some of its image, that mix themselves that aren't our usual way of experiencing image, sense, or language. He's so wily and careful that, you know, some critics talk about him as actually trying to write a poetry that can't be criticized because you can never pin him down. He's always partially saying something or ironizing something. What I and a lot of people love about Ashbury's work is that you get to choose which moments mean something to you. It's an incredibly open, indetermined work. What's amazing about Queer Poem a Day Lineage Edition is we've asked all these poets to choose a piece of work that's meaningful to them with very little restriction. Because we're doing this in a queer context and in a year where we're getting called names and threats for even doing a program like this, the very act of freedom itself of being able to say something that's nothing is sort of the ultimate freedom. What we're all feeling is what would have happened if Savage had been allowed to reach that middle age stage, that stage of fame that Ashbery achieved and created this massive legacy for so many of our poets through all of these readers who are able to make of this, you know, indetermined work what they will. The way the convex mirror pushes the image toward you of self, of reckoning, that's our work as people who put this project together. I think it is why as much as we haven't maybe exposed or discussed it yet, it's why there's all kinds of ways that even doing this programming has been dangerous because of people not wanting the mirror, the one that we all have as queer people, pushed toward them. They There are all kinds of ways that that self-reckoning and the ways that it is related to being part of any community is difficult for some, but necessary for us to have lineage and to keep going. I don't think anybody can say it better than Eileen Miles. They were a participant in year one of Queer Poem A Day, sending us an amazing original poem called Love Song. And they wrote a piece after Ashbury passed in 2017 that very wryly said, oh no, there's nothing political about a gay person loving art. And of course, there's everything to that. This quote from Ned Rorm about Robert Savage comes from the CD In I Sky Symphony, which features Robert Savage's music. Ned Rorm says, quote, the primitive in music is a rare bird. Except for Ives, I can think only of Robert Savage. Poets in general are rare birds. And John Ashbery was often described as a rare bird for being a famous poet at all. And for being a famous difficult poet, famous experimental poet. And my hope is that that's becoming less rare. We've collected them. find out more about the Savage Ashbury connection and other studies of John Ashbury and music in our blog post, featured as the final entry of Queer Poem a Day Lineage Edition. All that's on our website, deerfieldlibrary.org slash queerpoemaday. We would like to extend our enormous gratitude to David Kermani for his time and for sharing his remembrances of Robert Savage and his and John's piano. As well as a huge thank you 
to Jeffrey Leffendorf at the Flowchart Foundation, to Karen Rothman, Ashbury's biographer, to Andrew Epstein, author of the Locust Solace blog and many wonderful books, for all of their enthusiasm in helping to uncover this mystery and lost lineage. We also want to point to the work of pianist Marcus Ostermiller, whose performances of and dissertation on Robert Savage have been pioneering in increasing the visibility of this remarkable composer. A last thank you to the friends of the Deerfield Public Library and the Village of Deerfield's Fine Arts Commission for their generous support. The music for our program is from AIDS Ward Scherzo by Robert Savage, performed by pianist Daniel Baer. Queer Poem a Day is directed by Lisa Hyten, poet and professor. And Dylan Zavagno, adult services coordinator at the library and host of the Deerfield Public Library podcast.